Hey everyone, I am doing a recording of the scraping presentation. The original recording from the webinar didn't come out well, so this is just a re-recording. In today's presentation, I'm going to talk about web scraping. We're going to look at the website poshmark.com, and we're going to use Python and some additional packages to gather the data. So an agenda, I'm going to give a quick introduction about myself and the group. Then we're going to talk about web scraping at a high level. Then we'll walk through a code example. I'm going to share the code file so you can walk through it on your own as well. And then during the webinar, there was obviously Q&A. It's so a little bit about me. I'm a product manager with General Assembly. I used to run operations at an online data science boot camp, and that's kind of where I picked up. Um, everything I know about Python and programming and data science. And then I'm a assistant organizer with Data Umbrella. So a little bit more about Data Umbrella. The mission of the group is to provide a welcoming and educational space for underrepresented groups or URGs in the fields of data science and machine learning. And we primarily do this through Meetup events, now virtual webinars, and open source sprints. With most of our events, um, it's open to people of all levels. We, we usually assume some familiarity with Python or data science, but we're happy to have beginners to advanced people attend. And then we're always looking for volunteers and speakers. So you can check out our homepage at dataumbrella.org and reach out to us if you want to learn more. So what is web scraping? I've uh, pasted the, the really technical dictionary definition here, which is the programmatic extraction of unstructured data from websites to usable structured data. If you have a technical background, you probably understand what this means, but for most people, this is just a bit out there. <laughs> so let's take a look at a practical example. On the left, we have a screenshot of Amazon listings uh, for TVs. And on the right is what our output would look like from scraping. So if you take a look at each row, um, which has an item, you see that there's, there's tons of usable information, right? We see the brand, Samsung, the size of the TV, the type of TV resolution, like 4K or 5K. Um, if it's a smart TV or not, then you can see how many reviews were written, what was the average rating, the price, the discount, the original price, the shipping, how many are in stock, uh, are there used, um, used or other sellers selling. So we can see that all on the website, but uh, that's not in a usable form unless you're, you know, just using your eyes. You can, you can read that, you can digest that. But if say we wanted to do the, extract the data for like 10,000 TV listings, right? Like I could do this manually for five or 10 or a hundred and it wouldn't be that bad. But if we wanted to repeat that process for a thousand or 10,000 listings, you'd want to use web scraping. And with web scraping, we can extract out the individual values from this website and extract out the brand, the TV size, uh, whether it's a smart TV or not, uh, what the price is, uh, whether there's price prime shipping or not. And I'll do a little aside and, and kind of explain how web pages work here as well. Web pages are built with HTML and CSS. So this is the output, um, but there are two components. So HTML is really the layout and the content. So for example, in HTML, you'll see a block that says Samsung and this text. And then you'll see a block that has the price, a block that has the image. And then what CSS does is you add classes to different HTML blocks. And for example, in CSS, you can tell it to make this image 200 by 200 pixels. You can tell the web page to print this out in smaller font and red. So that's what CSS does, right? Make this font orange, make this font bigger and bold. And so HTML gives it the layout. So we want text here, we want the stars here, we want more text, the pricing here, we want the shipping text here, we want the stock pricing. And then CSS tells you how to style that. So 
we want the shipping in gray and smaller, and then we want this in red. So that's that's how those work, and and we'll we'll take a look at that in the code notebook. I thought I'd just give you a a brief summary of that. So how is web scraping used in real life? These are just a couple of use cases. There's dozens more, so you can keep track of competitors, uh, monitor consumer sentiment, looking at reviews, aggregate news and other data like on Amazon, uh, lead generation and CRM enrichment. So finding out the background of people that contact you, um, gathering data for news stories like 538 and the New York Times or the Washington Post. So what are we scraping today? We're going to be looking at Poshmark.com. So if you're not familiar with Poshmark, you can think of it more as like a hip eBay or Etsy. Uh, it's basically a social platform for clothing, shoes, and accessories. So you can buy and sell used and new clothing items, and it's, and it's become incredibly popular um, with the with the younger audience, the millennial and younger generation. Um, but I think I think it's a cool platform. I've actually used it a couple times uh, to buy some items. I I like uh, fashion, so I thought it was cool and. There was the reason I was actually interested in scraping Poshmark is that compared to other social commerce platforms, they don't have like a saved search feature. So say you're really interested in the example here, like you really want Clark boots in a certain style and a certain size. There's actually no way. I mean, it's probably on the roadmap. I don't know why they haven't built it, but there's no way to like save that search and get like a daily digest or weekly digest, at least in the last month when I saw it. So on eBay or Etsy or really any other social commerce platform, you usually can save your search and get like a daily digest or a weekly digest. Like, Hey, these were the items posted in that. And so I did this scraping exercise in order to build like a personal email reminder that would send me uh, updates. Like, Hey, these things were, were posted under this category or under this, like these parameters. And, uh, I mean, it's it's on their roadmap map somewhere. I mean, dozens of people have told them. I've seen people complain about it online and like Reddit and other like public review and forums. So it's definitely there. But that was kind of my interest in scraping. So I would scrape a certain search and then send myself an email rem reminder. So to get started, you can uh, just access this link. To goes to my GitHub repo and, and I've included this uh, this uh, binder link. It's a cloud-based program which allows you to run Jupyter Notebooks. And I've seen some other people use it and, and essentially what it does is it builds a Docker image under the hood. It'll take a probably 20, 30 seconds to get running. Okay, so I'm just gonna go line by line and, and walk through uh, my logic and the decisions I made. And then, um, yeah, and, and that's pretty much uh, the presentation will comprise of the rest of the notebook. To get started, the first cell is really just a, a way to set some custom settings in IPython. So I'm just expanding the window and uh, making the text bigger. Web pages 101. The websites are built using HTML and CSS. HTML is a type of markup language. You can think of it similar to Markdown. It provides the layout for our websites. And then CSS provides the styling. So when you have different font sizes, um, colors of text and backgrounds, uh, spacing between elements. And you can see here, uh, we have a screenshot of Poshmark, but why don't we just take a look at the actual website. And this is Poshmark.com, if you aren't familiar. It's it's just a, a social commerce platform, so there are listings of diesel men's jeans here. And you can see um, all the images, all the prices, all the text, who the sellers are. And you'll notice on this website, there are 
a bunch of repeating tiles and each tile kind of has some items inside of it. So if we take a look at the HTML code, you'll notice that there are a bunch of blocks and they're all called the same things. They're all, the, they're all divs and they have a class a tile call x12 xl6 and so the tile is what we're mostly concerned about the other classes are basically showing how it would appear in in kind of like a mobile view so how many tiles would you have in a row and so what we'll notice when we take a look at this div is that each of these tiles actually has the same underlying code underneath it um, but to the the actual text or image link is different, but the markup is the same. So we're going to use that with Python to kind of extract out the data. So if we take a look under this tile, there's a card, and then we have a link block, which is a, a tag. And so the link has a image underneath it. So if you, if you click that link, it actually goes to the, if you click the link or the top half or the image, goes to the individual page of the listing. So we'll go to this diesel jeans listing. And so that's just one block. And then you have another items detail block, which is denoted with the div. And then you have conditions. And then you have the price and the brand as well. And you'll notice that these each have these weird, sometimes named classes, uh, FW dash dash bold. And then here you have some better thing a better named class, which is tile details pipe size. And so these classes are the same if we take a look at the next tile. And so that's, that's what we'll do. If we take a look at the next tile, you'll notice that the classes are the same. And we're going to use that to extract out the data. So once we figure out how to scrape and extract the data from one tile, we will repeat it on all the tiles. Let's dive into the code. We're going to scrape down uh, the denim listing. So the first thing we have to do is use the request package. We're going to import get from that. And we'll have the URL. And what we're going to do is we're going to run get on that URL. And it's going to return a response object. The response object has a, a status and a text. And the status is, is kind of like what happened, did you get the page or not? And the text is the actual raw HTML text. And so we're going to just print out a slice of the first 500 characters. Now it's a large string, so don't print it all out because it'll be hundreds and hundreds of lines. Um, so you can see this is just kind of the HTML page. It has, the, has kind of the title there, diesel jeans for men. Boshmark, and then of course all the rest of them is there as well. We're going to use uh, the package called Beautiful Soup, and that is meant for parsing raw HTML. And what we do is we give it the HTML string, and then we feed it a parser, and then it will return a Beautiful Soup object, and we can run very uh, specific methods on that Beautiful Soup object. So there are several methods. Uh, what we're going to do is we're actually going to use a find all. So if you notice when we go back to the top and look at all the tiles, you'll notice that all the tiles have a class tile. And that's only for these elements on the page do they have that class tile. So what we're going to do is 
we're going to research and find all the elements that have tile and that will give us um, our clothing containers. So on the soup object, we run the method find all, and we, we give it the element, so the div element, and then we give it the class uh, tile. And remember, you have to have class underscore equals, and that's because class is, of course, a protected keyword in Python. So you can never have, you can never just type in class without actually defining a class. And here we go, we get um, a result set, which is just a type of beautiful soup object, and then just like a combination of several beautiful soup objects, and then uh, we have the length, which is 48, which makes sense because we get 48 listings when the page loads. So we can take a look at the first tile because it's just uh, a result set, which is similar to a list. We can extract out the first element and then print it. Now, unless you're familiar with web development, this is going to look like a lot of gibberish. Uh, it's very hard to read and see what's going on. What we can do is we can actually run prettify on that text, and what that will do is actually indent everything properly so we can read it better. But still, it's it's very hard to read. You, you will notice some of the blocks kind of breaking out. You have like the top link block, which has the image in it. Then you have like the item details, which has the title and, and so forth. So now what we want to do is extract out the individual values. In order to extract out the values, what we need to do is find each element that we want that has kind of either the title or the price or the brand and then and then extract out the text. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our tile and we're gonna do find the A tag, the link tag, that has the class tile title. So we have one A tag at the beginning that has uh, kind of the link to the individual page and the image. And so that's useful. We definitely want that. So for example, it, it takes you to the page. But we're really interested in the tile title. So that is actually the second A tag um, within item details. So it's in item details and then a title condition container. And then here we have this the A tag, and it has the tile title. And so when we find that element, so we see here again, this has the link to the individual and um, uh, the title. And so what we want to do is we find that A tag and then we want that, the one specifically that has the class tile title. If we look for other A tags, we're going to get other uh, HTML elements. So when we print it out, we get this whole block of text. and.
this is you know this is what we wanted but uh, we we really want some specific information from there so it has the the link to the individual page but really what we want is the the title and so what we can do is we can run we can run this method on that object so what we do what we would want to do is just run the same code and then, and then just modify it so what we're going to do is beautiful soup has this method called get text it's it's just built in and and what it does is it just gets the underlying text in between the a tag opening which is that whole part that's the the you know uh, HTML tags have to usually open and close. Some are self-closing, but the majority open and close. So we have A, and then we have in the middle of the text, and then the cl closing with the backslash. So what this does is, when we do get text, we we get the text in between a tag. And so when we print it out, we we get the text now. Um, we don't have any of the extra HTML. We just get that. You'll notice it looks a bit weird. We have all this space. Um, there's like a new line, and there's all this white space, and and really that that happens when HTML pages and elements are dynamically generated. So you can see even the space appears in the in the code right there. And so what we can do is we can we can actually pass a parameter strip equals true, and that's going to strip uh, all the white space. And then we really just repeat the same logic on the other elements. So we can find the span with the class fw dash dash bold which corresponds to the span that stores the, the price. Actually, funny story, I made this uh, tutorial two weeks ago and then just checked it the night before, and this class had actually changed and I had to fix it. It had changed its name and I had to fix it to make sure the code was working. Um, before I recorded this. So you just notice, uh, I'm just kind of highlighting with the HTML that it has it has like a tree structure, and so uh, sometimes if you don't have like well defined classes or they're they're just gibberish, uh, what you can do is you can actually just try to find uh, like a parent element or a top level element, and then you can find children and sibling elements and kind of traverse the tree. That's what they call it. So here we're just going to find the span again with the class fw dash dash bold. And that's going to get our span element. And if we just do the same logic, get text strip equals true, we get out the price. And then we can do the same thing for size. We can get the a tag with the class tile details pipe size. And then we get size 36, and we can do the same thing with brand, and we get diesel. Um, the the last two will be a little different. We're going to be looking at uh, the link. And so with the link, we can, we can just grab uh, the link with the class tile title. But then what we're going to do is we actually want to get one of its attributes. And so if you remember this big block of code, with the a tag, it has a bunch of attributes. So it has the href attribute and all these other ones. And href is basically stands for a link, so a reference. And so 
that is the reference to the individual product page. And so that's the attribute we want to get the value for. You can almost think of it like a dictionary as a bunch of key value pairs, right? The key is the href, the value is that string. And so if we just get the href, you can see we get this string value, um, and you can even get the class or, or any other, other kind of attribute. The one problem with this string value is that it's it's not complete, right? It's it's the trailing string. It's the trailing URL after you have Poshmark.com. So what we'd actually want to do is just add www.poshmark.com before that to get the actual working link. And then we, we can really just do the same thing with the image. We want to get the image URL in case we want to store the image later. So we can get we can find the image. There's only one image tag nested under there. And then we want to get this source uh, attribute. And so we can get the value for that. Uh, the next step we want to do is we can just kind of print out a summary of our data. Uh, the problem is that when you scrape uh, information from a website, everything is a string value. So all these are strings, and, and what we really want to do is we want to convert the price to just an int, and then the same with the size, right? We just want to say, all right, we have a, the price is 55 because we, we, we'll know it's in dollars, and then the size is 36, and, and we'll kind of just know that's um, 36 uh, waist size inches for men's like men's jeans because we're looking at men's jeans so we're going to take the first price variable and then we're just going to use a basic string manipulation to replace out the unwanted characters you can use something more complicated like regular expressions, but I, but I think since our use case is very simple, um, it makes sense just to use a string dot replace. And so what we're going to do is we're going to replace the dollar sign with a empty string. So essentially, we'll delete the dollar sign. And so now we get fifty five, but it's still uh, of type string. So what we want to do is wrap it into a int type conversion. So if you do that, you will actually get an integer fifty five. And the reason you can't just do that, uh, you can't just int first price, is because it's unable to kind of convert the uh, string, like the dollars, the dollar sign string, that makes it uh, that causes some issues. Now we can do the same exact thing with size. We'll just replace the size colon space with an empty space, so essentially deleting it, and then we can print out the type and, and the value. Now, one thing you'll notice with the image link is that you can actually see the posted date. So this product was posted on 2020, uh, May 10th. And uh, what we can do is we actually can ex extract that and find out how long an item has been listed. So we could, we could kind of subtract out the difference between the posted date and today's date. So here we can, uh, we can kind of find the value 2020. And what that really does is it find this is a string, so we can we can do string indexing. So we'll find the index value. Uh, so when does when does that start? So it starts at the forty third character, and then uh, or forty fourth if you're indexing from zero, and then 
all the dates are the same, right? It's it's ten characters long. Uh, you have you have the year, you have the month, and you have the day, and then the slashes in between. And so you can technically find the beginning and end and just extract that out because you know all the date strings will be the same for all the image links. And so you just do a string slice and, and just extract out that um, substring. And then we're going to bring in a date util parser package. Now this is, is going to do some magic underneath, but uh, essentially you can parse a bunch of different string dates and, and then return a Python date object. So we really just we just really import parse and then and then just feed it and then it finds out that uh, what the date is. And if you want to find the difference between days, you can actually use a date time to find out today's date or right now's date and then it will find the exact day and, and seconds and then uh, we can kind of subtract out the difference between the days and, and take the absolute value of the number of days and we get one and so you're always going to get a positive number uh, because we did the absolute value but also because um, you kind of have um, seconds and minutes that happen difference and then Again, if you're doing this in a professional workshop workflow, you'll have to make sure you have like the, the time zones and everything. But but normally what you'll do is you'll scrape the raw data, store the raw data in kind of a flat file like CSV or JSON. Then you will type format the data and then you will extract out new features. So you, you'll want to kind of silo each process so you can create different versions of the data. And then we'll just take a few minute break. The next part of the notebook is really showing how to refactor code and, and, and create functions. And so a, the code before was just really procedural code, kind of a string string code what you would call just kind of writing what comes up and then just trying to put it all together and, and make sure it works but what you want to do is really create functions and modularize it and and so here are some good guidelines um, just like sensible names single responsibility includes a doc string returns a value and is not longer than 50 lines and I don't really follow this exactly in the functions I've created but just to give you um, an example of what some better better organized code would look like and just kind of each function is responsible for one thing you know extracting the title extracting the price extracting the brand um, and so forth And normally you probably wouldn't have two things. For example, like in this price function, I am getting the price and then I'm type converting and formatting it. You'd you'd actually separate that into uh, two functions so you can kind of have a single responsibility. But that's more just a kind of, you know, just some software engineering tips. And then here I have another function called combined data. And what this does is it has a bunch of try and accept blocks and then it returns an object with all the values but with web scraping sometimes there is no values on the web page right like a title could be missing a size could be missing it might not have a size it could be like unisex sizing or whatever and that's why we have to have try and accept block accept blocks because we need to return an empty string or an empty value in case it doesn't find anything because we don't want our code just to break and, and crash in the middle of a loop and so that's why it looks really ugly um, but but that's just what we need to do in order to ensure that uh, ensure that the code runs 
and doesn't kind of break several times. And so once we have those values, you know, title or price, size, brand, and all those values um, from the tile, you know, basically we take a tile and then we, we insert that in there and then run all these kind of nested functions. We just return this object, uh, just a dictionary key value pairs of, um, the pre of all the values. And so let's, let's try to extract out all the tiles on an initial page. We're going to download the page we're going to create a beautiful soup object. We're going to extract out all the tiles. And then, I, and then I have kind of this list comprehension, which is really just an easy way to do a for loop while appending to a list. I can, I can kind of just like break out what that looks like in case you're not familiar. So if we have all the tiles, we have a list of all the HTML tiles. Um, this is what a, a list comprehension will look like next. Basically, we'd want to run a function on every single tile and return a dictionary of the values. So what we do is for each tile in item tiles, we would run the function combine data on the tile and we would assign that to a variable. It could be it could be anything. And then what we would want to do is we would have some like item objects and we'd append that. So you'd also have to create that item objects. Uh, it would be an empty string. And really what a list comprehension does is, is just this is just a very common procedure that you have to do in Python encoding. And so it just abstracts that to one line. And this is not something you can do in every language. It's it's something that only exists in Python and a couple other languages. So, um, But it's just a nifty trick. All right, so we have 48 tiles. That means if we run this, we should have 48 item objects. And then if we print, we can take a look at each one. Um, so it's a bit hard to read, so you can bring in the package pprint or pretty print, and then uh, it, uh, it looks better. Kind of the same as prettify, just gives you the indentation and spacing. Oh yeah, so one thing to notice is you're only going to get 48 p items because uh, you'll notice here as I'm scrolling, it adds more items to the page using JavaScript. Um, but uh, we can only get 48 because we're doing a programmatic request. And if you really want to get all the pa items that load, you, you really have to use another package that that lets you use headless browsers. And what that does is it, it creates like a ghost instance of Firefox or Chrome and actually browses the page and then downloads the the uh, HTML. And so in the Git repo that I've linked, there is an advanced notebook that kind of shows you how to use an advanced, uh, a headless browser. It, it kind of requires a bit of configuration, so it might not that be easy, it might not be easy to run that on your local computer. All right, so why don't we look at a bunch of brands? Uh, let's extract out a bunch of other men's denim brands. And, and really what we can do is we can just run that same block of code, uh, just looping through a list of brands. And so if I append this to this like master store, what we're gonna get is the store is gonna be a length of four because we have four brands. And then each item within the store is gonna have 48 item objects. So it's really going to be a list of lists, right? Four, and then each four has 48. And we don't really want that because we really just want four times 48, right? Uh, like 196. Or, yeah, is it 100? Or maybe 192. Sorry, my math is my math is off. But uh, what we really want to do is just extend out uh, the list. And, and so instead of append, we do extend, and that will just add and add and add to the same master list. So I think, oh yeah, a 192, right? Okay, there we go. And then 
we'll have a length of the first item as eight, and that's really just an eight, uh, eight key value pairs from the object. So just gonna run through this last section really quickly. If you if you are familiar with pandas or not, pandas is kind of like Microsoft, it's like Excel for Python, if you will. It allows you to manipulate and organize data in a tabular form. And so um, we can uh, kind of create a new column with the length of the title. We can look at a preview of the data. Uh, we can kind of take a subset of the numeric data um, just kind of like the price, size, difference, length. Um, so then we can, the reason why I just want the numeric data is so I can I can do some kind of analysis on that by just looking at like the mean and, and the outliers and, and so forth. So you'll notice the uh, the kind of difference, uh, the difference is, is the days, right? We have some that were listed for two days and some that were listed for like a couple years. And uh, so I guess something was just not popular or too expensive, or even if you're actually a Poshmark user, you'll know this. Some people just kind of check out, right? They they uh, kind of list a product and then and then they they don't ever check their account. So you notice some brands are listed. The median is longer, and the price is obviously different for different brands. You can bring in matplotlib uh, to visualize some of these things, like the kind of distribution of prices. Um, and you'll notice it's more pronounced with the individual brands, but you kind of have like two uh, peaks. You have like one centered around 20, 30, 40, and then one at the end. Um, and so really what that is, is again, this is like another kind of data science domain expertise. Or if you use Poshmark, people can list new and used objects uh, or items. So for each brand you'll see two groupings and one grouping is the used items and the other grouping is like complete like totally new items or uh slightly slightly used or, or like new without tags type of thing and so so something definitely if we were to redo this analysis is we definitely want to extract out whether uh yes yeah, so you, you see kind of like the separate peaks or the separate groupings and so one thing you want to do is extract out uh new and used items You could have kind of like a Boolean value in an, in another column. And we can also look at just like the difference, uh, the days listed as well as a whole, and then uh, and then kind of by brand, and and you'll see some. Of the, we can you can kind of look at which brand has the longest one. So it looks like Naked and Famous takes the cake. It's it's more of a niche brand, a bit esoteric. So uh, yeah, it would make sense that some items were just like a little out there. So there's, there's obviously more analysis you can do. I kind of did a very uh, rudimentary exploratory uh, data analysis, but it was it was useful. You know, this is just the length of the titles, which doesn't really show anything. Um, so feel free to, uh, this was like a live webinar, so there was questions, but uh, there's a feedback form in the notebook and, and you know, you can send me a message on uh, Meetup if you have any questions or uh, concerns or just anything about scraping. I'm not like a professional, I, I just kind of do it as a hobby, so I might not be able to answer all your questions, but I'll try my best. And stay tuned for more events from Data Umbrella and PyLadies in the future.